I'm Billy Downing. I live in North Reading, Massachusetts. I've been a member of the 99 since uh, March of 1968. It's one of the greatest things that I've enjoyed in my lifetime. And Billy, why did you um, why did you take up flying? Why did you want to learn to fly? Well, I always enjoyed watching airplanes in the sky when I lived in the country in Texas. And then I met a flight engineer. And it was obvious from the get-go that we were going to get married. So we talked about what we were going to do. Do you want to learn to sail a boat or would you rather learn to fly? And he had not gotten his pilot's license yet either. So I said, oh, let's learn to fly. So that was the beginning of that. So um, when you had your first flight, what was your impression when you took your very first flight? I was thrilled. I, I went, actually, I went with my husband. We weren't married yet. We went out of a small dirt field near San Antonio, Texas, and had a ride, both of us sitting in the back seat with a man in the front with farmer's clothes and cloudhopper shoes. <laughs> and I said to myself at that time, if he can fly a plane, I can too. <laughs> did you learn and take lessons together at the same time? Yes, we did. Did you both solo at the same time? Very close. <laughs> in fact, this is my, my trophy that uh, Dustin was giving at that time to anybody who soloed. And I soloed on the 3rd of June, 1964, and I think he had soloed on the 1st of June, 1964. Ah, neck and neck. <laughs> neck and neck, right. Now I noticed that trophy has a, a, a woman depicted there. Yes. I mean, how many other women were doing that at, at that at period At that time, time, I was the only woman in that group. I didn't finish my lessons in California, though. We had to move to Massachusetts and move a house and get, find us so the place to live. And then I restarted my lessons here at Hanscom Field. And at that time, I think there were three women in the Arrow Club at Hanscom Field. With quite a bevy of men. <laughs> and what year was it that you got your license? Uh, 1967. Mm -hmm. One of my most interesting experiences in learning to fly was trying to land at the wrong airport. My instructor was from Hollis, New Hampshire. And I was learning to fly out of Hanscom Field. So we did a whole bunch of stuff one day, and then he said, I want you to take me home. So I landed at Nashua, and he got out of the plane, and he said, do you think you can find Hanscom Field? And I said, oh, I think so. So it was a beautiful, clear day, so I took off. And naturally, I headed for the first big brown spot I saw, <laughs> without even looking at the compass. And I'm talking to the tower at Hanscom Field, because they're very close. And uh, then I see that I'm not landing on runway 29, it's 27. And I said to the tower, I think I'm at the wrong airport. And he said, do you know about DF Steer? And I said, no, never heard of it. He said, well, just key your mic, and I'll tell you where you are and give you directions to where you're supposed to be. So he guided me to Hanscom Field, and I landed on the right runway. <laughs> I was actually at Fort Devens Airport. <laughs> incredible experience that I had is that my husband and I flew from California to Massachusetts while I was still a student pilot. And uh, we took off from, uh, from um, McCannon Field in Concord. And uh, we got up to, you know, just about to where we, we went to fly over Mount Hamilton to see the observatory there. So all of a sudden, the door on my side, I'm sitting as co-pilot, popped open. And I said, oh, now, what do we do? Do we have to go back? Because that never happened before. He said, no, I'll just slow the plane down, and I think you're strong enough. If you can get out far enough and give it a pull. And so he slowed way down, and I got the door shut. So that was number one. So we landed at Bakersfield, and he said, now it's your turn to fly. And I said, okay. So I get in the pilot seat. I had been checked out, and it was okay with the club and on the plane for me to fly. So I don't know about the FAA, but... <laughs> Anyway, uh, he, I get in the plane and we take off for Prescott, Arizona, and <laughs> he goes sound asleep. So I'm flying along, flying along. When I get to the Colorado River, I said, still wake up. I said, we're at the Colorado River and there's supposed to be the town of uh, Peoples or Pebbles or something, and I don't see it, any town. It's just a, just a river. So he wakes up and he starts filling with things. And he said, I think our compass is off. He said, I don't know if we're north or south of it, but uh, we'll fly it down the river and see what we find. So we flew down the river and we found whatever town it was supposed to be. And then he said, well, this compass is 30 degrees off. And so he said, just correct for 30 degrees and go ahead. So, okay, I'm flying for Prescott. And all of a sudden I see mountains in front of me. <laughs> and I thought, oh my. So I start, you know, creeping up. <laughs> 
climbing. And uh, I got up to 10,000 feet, and I finally poked him again. I said, Stu, I'm at 10,000 feet. What do I do now? <laughs> and he said, oh, okay, I guess I better wake up. So he woke up. So I flew on and got Prescott in sight. And then I said, oh, Stu, I'm so tired. I don't think I can land the plane. <laughs> and he said, okay, I'll land the plane. So that was fine. So the rest of the trip was fine. We got all the way to Sandusky, Ohio. And our generator quits. And he says, well, I think we better land here and spend the night. So we landed and spent the night. And then we were able to get the plane started the next morning. We got it on into Massachusetts just fine. <laughs> so that was my first flight at 172. We had been learning in 150s, but they said, you have to take a, a trip in a 172. You can't take a long trip in a 150. So they checked us both out in a 172. And we were off. So by the time I got my pilot's license, I had quite a few long flights in my blog book already. <laughs> it was really wonderful. We, we came uh, east by way of New Mexico, and we returned by way of Wyoming, because we were in a 172, and it doesn't like the mountains in Colorado. <laughs> so whenever we returned from a trip, I got out my National Geographic map and would draw it on. And that trip was the purple line all the way across the country to Massachusetts, and then back again through uh, Wyoming, back to California. And in Nevada, this was in 19, uh, seven, no, 19, I can't remember the year now, 1964. We were actually able to follow the old airmail lights all the way through the state of Nevada at night one night. It was so clear we could see the stars reflected in the Great Salt Lake. And it was absolutely beautiful. And we made it all the way into Sacramento that night. Okay. We bought our first airplane in 1973. And we were planning a trip to Alaska at the time. And um, we bought the plane from uh, someone at Hanscom Field, and had uh, it was it was rented to them. So we thought, well, I'd well, already signed up to use an Aero Club plane, so we took an Aero Club plane to Alaska, and uh, that was a fabulous trip. Also, we had practiced for it a few years before by flying as far as Winnipeg, and they told us it was another, another 2,500 miles to Alaska, <laughs> and uh, we spent five weeks. Um, flying uh, 98 hours, and we landed, I think, at 45 different airports, and some of them twice. So that was a, a really fabulous trip. And if you want to see a map of that, I have, have that also. This is how we got to Alaska from Massachusetts, and then uh, this is the one of how we flew ourselves around. The purple trip we uh, did in our own plane, and the orange one we did by airline up to the, the Arctic Ocean. How many hours of experience did you have at that point in time? Oh. Did you get it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, you know, Linda, it, um, it's not so much the hours, it's how often you do it. And we made ourselves go almost every week and fly every week. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that I think, gives you more experience than a lot of hours. You might take a long trip and you get a lot of hours, and that's a lot of experience also. But doing it every week keeps you fresh. And I think that's an important Scotia and the Gaspé Peninsula. And those are nearby, but they're very beautiful places. And we did that three or four times. And then I ran out of space on that other map, so I started a new map. And then they're going to help me hold this one up. <laughs> this is some more trips, I think, 1977 to 1983. How many trips were those that you did? Oh, we must have done around the country at least seven or eight times. Yeah. And then up and down to Florida. I think we did that about 40 times. Whoa. Uh, and then to Texas. Uh, alone, quite often, into Oklahoma City to 99 same quarters. We did that several times, too. Okay, Linda just asked if we ever had any trouble on any of these trips. Basically, the answer was no. We had the generator go out twice, but uh, at the trip to Alaska, we did land on some rough runways. Sometimes they were not always there. Yeah. We were told we couldn't go into unpaved runways, but <laughs> we went into some rather uh, rough gravelly ones, <laughs> and the vibration was very hard on the brakes. 
and sometimes knock the brake pads right out of the plane. We had to have, yeah, inspect the brakes before every takeoff. And we landed on one grass strip that was full of rocks. After we looked at it the next day, we picked up a bunch of rocks before we took off the next day. But, um, no serious problems. We're very exciting things about the 99s are the wonderful air rallies that we have. This is the all-woman New England air rally, which was in 19, uh, I won with Lois Occhiloni as co I was co-pilot in 1972. Lois was a wasp and owned her own plane. And we had to predict our gas consumption and our time to fly the course. And uh, the consum gas consumption was perfect, and we were seven seconds off on our time. So we won that. We flew these all-women New England air rallies for quite some time, and then men started to apply. And so we finally had to allow the men in, <laughs> which was really fun because then my husband and I flew as a team. And we actually won one of them uh, out of Manchester, all around uh, northern New Hampshire and uh, Maine. And then we won the um, Empire 300 in New York State the same year. That was 1978. Go ahead. Okay. This is the course for the uh, Willimantic uh, Wyndham race that Lois and I won. Uh, it was starting at uh, Willimantic Wyndham um, Airport in Connecticut to Rutland, Vermont, down to Fitchburg, and back to um, Wyndham. And at the time, there was a lady mayor of uh, Willimantic, and she was so excited. And she came out, and I think she presented our prizes to us, our, our trophies to us at the... Uh, Wow. Let me, let me, let me, let me met my husband. He was a flight engineer. And of course he wanted to learn to fly, but he said, I'm, I think I'm through traveling. And I just said to myself, that's what you think. <laughs> but our uh, one fabulous trip was to Australia. And we flew ourselves around, if you can see the lines on this map, with, another, with a man who had five or four Cessna 172s and another man who had his own plane. And the five of us flew around on a safari around Australia, the eastern half of Australia, for two weeks. And that was a fabulous trip. Well, the question was, uh, have I stopped flying? And yes, I have stopped flying. We were flying somebody else's airplane for the last 17 years, and I returned the keys after my husband's death. And uh, I still ride with a lot of people, but uh, as far as doing the flying myself, it was a partnership thing. And uh, I've just kind of given it up, been there, done that, and it was absolutely wonderful, and uh, I'm very content to be where I am now. So your last flight was in 2006? Yeah, last flight was in 2006, uh, I think it was a poker run down to Connecticut, we spent the whole day doing it, and then uh, after that we did take another long trip around the country, but it was commercially. We went to the Powder Puff Reunion, we went to Silver Wings in Ohio, and then uh, to one of his airline reunions in California, my class reunion in Texas, and returned. And after that, he was very sick. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. I got my pilot's license in October of 1967, and I was very fortunate in that my instructor's wife was a 99. And he said, as soon as uh, you get a license, Pam has someplace she wants to take you. So she took me to a 99's meeting down at... Uh, Green Airport in Warwick, uh, Warwick, I guess, Rhode Island. And um, so they liked me and I liked them, but we had to attend three meetings so we could observe the 99s and they could observe us and then I was a member. So I've been a member since March of 1968. And uh, during that time I served as all officers in the chapter. I was the newsletter reporter for many, many years. And um, then I was governor. I don't remember serving any other uh, offices in the, the uh, section, but I probably did, I don't remember. But I was governor from 82 to 84. Mm -hmm. I had an absolutely wonderful time. I'm in a section meeting. They asked us to bring our aviation art. And I said, well, I am not an artist, but I do take lots of pictures. And so I had a set of pictures made. So we want to look at them first and see if we want to um, do something with them, or please don't fall, fall out. Actually, that, like this you. this first one is just our no, our official picture <laughs> in the airplane. Mm -hmm. But oh, down the Hudson River, oh, nice. New York. Before we allow the men to participate in the 
an old woman doing all their race. Stu would come along anyway. And the first one, I think, Cora Clark and I flew at Burlington, Vermont, and we just flew the plane up, flew in the race, and flew back home again. And he didn't come. But after that, he started to come. And he was really a peach of a guy, because he would participate no matter you know, what was going on. So one on air, it was announced that he had won a prize. <laughs> and we said, oh, what was, what was that for? Well, somebody had flown a 310 in the race and they had a passenger, and the passenger had gotten sick in the plane, and he had cleaned up the plane, so he got a certificate for cleaning up the plane. <laughs> this is a picture of Stu and I taken at Thanksgiving, 1985. And uh, he loved the 99s, he loved the, to participate in everything. Well, another funny incident on one of the trips. We took off in Montgomery, Alabama, and the generator went on the plane again. So Stu said, well, we're, it's almost nighttime, we better land. So we landed at Auburn. So to tease my father-in-law, I said, Pappy, this town is dry. And he, I thought he was going to start to cry. <laughs> and I said, oh, don't cry. I said, Stu has a flask. <laughs> so he had his drink that night, even though I knew Auburn, I don't know how I knew Auburn was dry. But That's me being installed as the governor of the 99s in 1982. The other two ladies there, Evelyn Kropp, and Lillian Emerson. And where was this? It was at a, at a club in um, Fitchburg, I think. I can, don't remember the exact location. So governor of the of New, New England. England. section of the 99. Go ahead. Okay. Well, in closing, I'd like to say that our flying was strictly for pleasure. We needed to be able to travel to the all four coasts of the country, <laughs> to see my family in Texas, our relatives in Florida, and uh, California, and, uh, oh, that's my clock, <laughs> wherever I put it. <laughs> but, uh, you know what? I well, just in closing, I'd like to say that our flying was strictly for pleasure. We needed to be able to uh, fly to Texas to see my family, fly to the West Coast to relatives in Florida, and uh, and we learned to fly just mainly for, for travel and, and pleasure. And we tried to go out every week to keep ourselves sharp enough to be good pilots. We loved to go to have those $98 hamburgers <laughs> and have much, much fun doing it. Saw a lot of New England in doing so. And I, I'm a Texan, but I love living in New England. She and I drove from here to Springfield for the section meeting. Mm -hmm. So we talked all the way. And she asked me about flying in Iowa and places where, where mm -hmm. all these lines. She said, I'm trying to teach my students you know, how to you know, find themselves. And we don't have many lines in, in New England. Right. Yeah, that's <laughs> she right. said, I know it's very different out west. Mm -hmm. And so we had talked about that. Yeah, yeah, it's very different. Okay, yeah. so, so we were Ripley. We just talking about our friend, my friend Ripley Miller, who was killed in a crash in Boston Harbor. In what she year? Was, uh, 1973, September mm -hmm. 23rd, 1973. I'll never mm -hmm. forget the date. She was flying cancel checks from Hartford to Boston, and she was flying a twin. I don't remember what kind anymore, but uh, she hadn't been flying it very long. And they had made her go, do a go around at Logan Airport. It was very foggy, and they couldn't see if the plane in front of her had gotten off the runway yet. And when she went around, they think that uh, she had some kind of gas problem and uh, wasn't able to switch tanks or something, and went into Boston Harbor. And mm -hmm. wasn't found for many days, actually. Mm -hmm. But uh, we were very close friends. Just two days before that, I had, uh, or one day before that, actually, I had driven from here to Springfield for a section meeting with her. And she was an excellent instructor, right? Oh, she right? was an excellent instructor. Tumac Airport loved her, and all of her students loved her. The owner of Tumac's heart was broken and, you know, no longer had her. Her daughter, Julia, has written a book about Ripley's life, and uh, she, I was asked to help write, you know, help recall some of these, the stories for it. And uh, I was driving with my husband one day, and we picked up our mail at the post office, and I opened a letter from Julia, and I started crying. And Sue said, oh my, what's happened now? And I said, well, it, nothing new. I said, this is a letter from Julia. She's asking me to help her write a book about Ripley. And I said, I certainly will. And what's the title of the book? The long, it's called The Long White Scarf.
And it's a wonderful book about Ripley's life. I had my 80th birthday on 29 December 2011. And uh, I was just asked the question, would I fly again? And I think that uh, with a little instruction, I could be a pilot again. Because you don't really forget it? No, you don't really forget it, no. It's like anything you learn to do, like swimming or anything, it, it's kind of in your muscles. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, it comes back. And I haven't uh, come back to it because, as I said before, it was kind of a, a partnership thing, something that I did with my husband. And, uh, we met four professors from Middlebury College. Ah. And they were in two one, 172s, two in each plane, and they were flying up you know, together to Alaska. And we met somewhere along the route. And if you could say anybody was ever green with envy, those four men said to Stu, you are the luckiest man in the world to have a wife that will fly with you. Our wives will not even get in the planes with us. That's why we're the, the four of us traveling together. And they were so envious that, you know, to see us flying stuff. And, uh, they said, somebody came to the table and said, are you flying to Alaska? And we said, yes. They said, well, when you finish your lunch, come up to the office. The Flying Farmers did this last year, and we have all kinds of information that we can give you. So we went up to the office later, and they gave us all kinds of wonderful information, and were really, really nice to us. And also, the information about that you said about the places that if to follow the rivers, if if it was too stormy in the mountains? Yes, we, we did that at one time. We followed with the Liard River when it was too stormy in the mountains between Nelson and um, Fort Watson, I think. And it was very beautiful over, over the river. It was just, yeah, and it was just as good a track as, as the highway. There are no VORs up there. Mm. Yeah. Alaska maybe had a few, and, but the last one we left was down in uh, you know, some place in the U.S., North Dakota. So Canada had no VORs. Was that in the 70s? That was 1973.